next time we'll move on to other cues. So in this, in this section of the course, uh, we have uh, looking at motion as a source of information we'll do next Tuesday. And then uh, the two classes after that, we will focus on um, uh, perception of 3D shape from binocular vision. So just to remind you, I've shown you this slide before. Uh, this is, if you look at a blow up, a million time, 10 million time blow up of the surface microstructure of a shiny surface, uh, you'll notice that the surface is very smooth. If you do the same thing to a rough surface, so this would be construction paper here, you see all the fibers that went into making the paper and there are all kinds of nooks and crannies <coughs> in there. So what happens when light hits a surface like this, it bounces off like a billiard ball. And when it hits a surface like this, it gets scattered in different directions. And we're able to perceive that distinction, and we have a name for it. It looks something like, um, what's going on here? That's weird. I know I've got fresh batteries in here. All right, we'll do it the old fashioned way. Um, here's what that distinction looks like if you see it on an actual surface. So if you look at um, uh, this object right here, what does that material look like to you? Steel. What does it look like? Steel, like some sort of Steel, some kind of metal. You all agree that looks like a metal surface? How about this one? What's that look like? Uh, good guess. Um, so this one is what we refer to as matte. So the, the measure of how rough the microstructure is is a parameter called roughness. And if it's zero, that means the surface is perfectly smooth. And if it's 100, it means that it scatters light uniformly in all directions. So this is a high roughness surface, and uh, it looks matte is the, is the technical name we use to apply that. And this one looks shiny, uh, but in particular, it looks like a shiny metal. And I'll come back to that in a second. Now, many materials that we see as shiny have two components of reflection. So this would be true of high gloss black paint or shiny plastic. Um, so remember I told you uh, last week that pretty much all materials in the world fall into two classes. There are those that conduct electricity and they're called metals. And there are those that are insulators that don't conduct uh, electricity and they're called dielectric materials. Uh, many dielectric materials have a property uh, like this, where uh, typically where you get this is where you have like if you take a matte surface and you put a layer of varnish on top of it. Right? So the varnish is transparent and really smooth and the light bounces off that as a billiard ball. But then it's also able to pass through the varnish and interact with the surface underneath and that light gets scattered. So you have these two components, what's referred to as specular reflection here, that's the green reflections, and then you have what's called diffuse reflection, which is where the light gets scattered in different directions. And so if you put those two together, you get something that looks like this. Oh, that's not the slide I thought was coming up. Okay. This works anyway. So let's consider this object right here. Uh, this is a shiny white object. So it's white. Uh, the white part is the diffuse layer that's scattering. And then the highlights that you see along here are the smooth layer uh, that's reflecting in a specular way. Now the interesting thing here is that 
Here I've got three different types of materials that all look shiny. So this one, do you agree, looks like a metal? Uh, this one looks like a shiny black surface. This one looks like a shiny white surface. All right, now the question is, how do we tell them apart? They're all shiny. Now, up until recently, there's been a lot of research on what makes surfaces look shiny. And the, uh, the answer to that, is, well, there are a number of factors that can contribute to it, but the main one by far is the surface roughness. So if you have a low roughness, the surface will look shiny. If you have a high roughness, the surface will look bad or not shiny. But here we have three surfaces that look shiny, but yet they're qualitatively different. And so one of the questions is, how do we how do we tell these things apart? How do we label this as metal, that is shiny black, and that shiny white? Now, I got into this research a couple of years ago pretty much by, um, well, not completely by accident, but what I was trying to do is create um, metal objects in the computer graphics software that I use. And I was having a devil of a time. I couldn't get decent looking metal for the life of me. I just couldn't get metal to look right. Uh, and I started asking a bunch of friends of mine. It turns out that one of my uh, grad students was defending his thesis. And his father came to the defense. And we had a party afterwards. And I was talking to his father, who happened to be a photographer. And I was describing what I do. And he was describing what he do does. And I. Um, was telling him about my problem with metal, and he says, oh yeah, that's a problem in photography too. Anybody here a photo or avid photographer? Anybody tried to shoot metal in photography? Um, so anyway, what he told me was that the way photographers do this is you have to get control of the lighting. The lighting has a huge effect on the appearance of metal. And uh, in particular, he told me about a technique that he uses where you take a metal object and you put it in a translucent box. You don't know what translucent means. Translucent means the light can pass through the material. And when it does that, it gets diffused and it bounces around like crazy. And he says, so that you illuminate from outside the box and the light gets in because of the translucency and you get this nice, even, uh, uh, pattern of illumination that's uniform in many directions. He says it gets great metal every time. So I simulated that on my uh, computer and lo and behold, I got wonderful metal. <laughs> and to give you a sense of how that looks, uh, here we have three different patterns of illumination. So here I've stuck a sphere inside that white box you can see you got some light coming from all directions. This is the, the classic measure in computer graphics where you illuminate, you put some distant point light source. Uh, it's convenient for some things, but terrible for metal, as we'll see. And here, imagine you've got a couple of windows that are illuminating the scene, but nothing anywhere else. Um, so these are the four light fields that we ended up doing an experiment to look at this and test it. And uh, these are the four light fields that we use. Is this clear to everybody? Right, so this is a, a metal sphere uh, stuck in three illumination environments. And this is intended just to show you what the pattern of illumination looks like. Now, here I've shown you, I'm showing you three different metal objects. All of the objects you see here are metal. Uh, on the left is in that translucent white room. In the right is the scene with the two windows, and everything else is black. And in this case, it's just that point light source, and everything else is black. So who shall I pick on? Tell me what you see in this column. Yeah, but how would you identify the material? Oh, metal. It looks like metal. Would you identify these as metal? No. How would you identify those? Uh, maybe like a shiny plastic. Shiny black. And anybody disagree with her perception of these? 
All right, now keep in mind they're all metal. The only thing that's affecting that perceptual difference is the lighting. These are exactly the same objects. The only thing that's different is the lighting. So this is showing that the lighting can indeed have a mammoth effect on how you perceive these different materials. And we can see that in the data. Actually, I don't have the data quite yet. Here's an example on how would you perceive these? Uh, would you say shiny white? Not shiny black and definitely not metal. All right, so these are the distinctions that she's making. Anybody disagree with her perceptions? So we took stimuli like this and we had people rate them. They, they basically had two rating scales, one where they rated how metal the objects looked and one where they rated how shiny the objects looked. As we were curious whether the metal and shininess, how they would hook up with each other. And what we found was that only in the white room, that's the ambient light here, um, did you get significant judgments where the subject said, that really looks like metal. And all the other stimuli, they said, no, it's not metal. But they did rate them as fairly shiny. Um, so all the light fields looked, um, could generate shininess, but only the, the white room, the ambient light, could generate a strong perception of metal. So this was a first pass on this. We also investigated how roughness would influence what's going on. And um, here's some of the stimuli for that. So I've got the three light fields, the white room, the two area lights, and the point light. And now we're varying roughness. So this is roughness 15, 30, 60, and 90. And as you see, as the roughness goes up, the perception of metal and the perception of shininess goes down. So here, roughness goes up, perception of shininess goes down. Same down here. So roughness <laughs> is also influencing both the appearance of metal and the appearance of shininess. High roughness, everything looks matte. Low roughness, it looks like shiny and it might look like metal or shiny black, depending on what the nature of the lighting is. And here are the data for that. Main thing to keep in mind here is as roughness is going up, perception of shininess is going down and the perception of metalness is also going down. Now let's take a closer look at the differences between metal and dielectric materials. Now I don't want to get into too much of the guts of this. Has anybody taken, uh, how many of you have had physics? Um, and how much optics did they cover when you took physics? Uh, not any that I can remember. Um, anybody take physics where they covered the Fresnel equations? Okay, so the Fresnel equations are a, um, uh, by a French mathematician, physicist, guy by the name of Auguste Fresnel, uh, who worked out how it is that light is reflected and refracted from different materials. And he wrote a, a, a really ugly looking equation, involves imaginary numbers. It's probably why they didn't cover it in your undergraduate class. They shy away from imaginary numbers whenever possible, but um, you don't have to know the equation. What you should know, though, is how dielectrics are different from metals. So one of the ways that dielectrics, so glass is a dielectric material, and if you look here, uh, it reflects almost no light except at pretty high incident angles. Now, these curves can be a little bit misleading because it's only telling us about reflectance, but what else is affected by the incident angle? I've talked about this a couple of times now, right? What was that demo I did on the board with the, uh, with the flashlight? 
was trying to show that illumination goes down as the incident angle goes up. So in order to get the luminance, what you have to do is multiply this curve by that one, and that gives you the, um, uh, the luminance. And the bottom line is, if you look at a metal like silver, right, it reflects most of its light where the light is perpendicular to the, um, uh, the surface. So if you see silver reflects about 100% of the light at all incidence angles, but the illumination is going down with incident angle, therefore the luminance is going down as well. Now, if you take a dielectric material like this, it's hardly reflecting any light at all for a large range of incident angles, but then it peaks around 75 degrees. That's where you get your maximum amount of reflection. And uh, if you see this in computer graphic text, it's often called the Fresnel effect. It's named after uh, Fresnel is the guy who first developed these equations. And I'll show you an example where you can see that for yourself. Um, so here's an example of two uh, balls. The one on the left is made of silver. And as you can see, it's brightest in the central region. But if we look over here, this is a shiny black object. And notice it's brightest in the periphery. That's the Fresnel. See how it's bright out here in the periphery? and not so much in this one. That's the Fresnel effect. So let's go backwards. So you've got two things going on. One thing is, is that the metals reflect much more light than the dielectric materials do. All right, so that's one way. This is, that's very much like the problem in lightness perception, right? Black things reflect very little light. White things reflect a lot of the light. Uh, same thing's happening with metal and shiny black materials. Um, the other thing that's going on is the way the reflections are influenced by the incident angle. So for shiny black objects like this, right, most of your reflection is coming at uh, pretty high incidence angles. Whereas for silver, you're getting pretty high reflectance all the way across the board. So these are two potential sources of information that one could potentially use in order to distinguish metal objects from shiny black objects. <coughs> So let's first of all consider intensity. So what you have in the left column is an object made of metal, and in the right column you have a shiny black dielectric material. Now all the reflections in all of these scenes are completely specular. There's no diffuse reflection at all in here. Um, so this was, these two have the same illumination, and you clearly see the metal one looks like metal, and the uh, shiny black one looks like shiny black. Do you all agree? But now let's play a game. I'll take this one, and I'll lower the illumination by a factor of five. And how does that look? Does that look like metal or shiny black? What do you think? And now I'll take this one and I'll raise the illumination by a factor of five. And we get this. Does that look like metal or shiny black? All right, so I can take the metal one, alter the illumination, and make it look shiny black. And I can take the shiny black one, increase the illumination, and I can make it look like metal. A pretty powerful effect. Now, there is, remember I told you about that Fresnel effect. Look around here at the periphery of his head and down here. You see that white, bright region around the edge? That's the Fresnel effect. You see that here and here? Not present. So if it's me looking at these things and I know what to look for, 
I, I could tell you instantly, oh, this is a shiny black object because of that fringe. But naive observers don't do that. They rate it, they rate this as metal and they rate that as shiny black. All right, so the uh, intensity of illumination is playing a role here. Yeah? So you're saying the black one is not black in the, on the bottom? On the bottom, this is metal. That's metal, yeah. And that's shiny black. So how do you know the metal one is actually metal? I mean, the, I'm clearly talking about the like, Yeah, so this is the same thing as this, but with the intensity of illumination lowered by factor five. This is the same as this one, but the intensity is raised by a factor of five. So what this is showing is that you would think the perception of a material, like metal or shiny black, would only be influenced by the material. So metal things ought to look like metal, and shiny black things ought to look like shiny black. What these data are showing, or what this demo is showing, is that no, that's not completely the case because the pattern of illumination is also having a role in this. So you can think of our judgment of material in this particular case is more of a heuristic than it is a, uh, an accurate assessment of what the actual material is. Um, and in a second, I'll tell you exactly the information that we're using. Now there's another factor that can affect performance. It's not only the intensity of the light, it's also the pattern of the light. Let me go back one more time to this curve. <coughs> All right, so let's take a shiny black object as a reflectance curve that looks like this. And what this is telling us is that, you know, for most of, most of the incident angles, it's reflecting hardly any light. But there, as you get higher incident angles, it reflects more light, right? So the most light is reflected in this range, right here. That's not true for metals. So what this means, now think about what purely specular surfaces do. The light hits like a billiard ball. So if you take a point on a surface, there's, um, so when will the light so let's say I have a surface that looks like this, and the light's bouncing like a billiard ball. Where would the light source have to be for you to see the reflection? It should come from this direction here, and because you're gonna get a mirror reflection. Um, now, let's suppose you're a shiny black surface, and you're only from any given point on the surface, you're only getting light from a narrow range of directions, but there are only a narrow range of directions that reflect a significant amount of light. That means you're gonna get a sparse pattern of highlights. Because most of the surface, where you have angles that look like that, aren't gonna reflect very much light. Now how else might you get a sparse pattern of highlights? What if I had a sparse pattern of lights? You remember, this, right? So you see the white room here? I'm getting reflections from pretty much all over the object. And the reason I'm getting that is because I got light hitting the object from every direction. Here, I'm only having light hitting the object from one direction. And so you get this sparse pattern of highlights. This, by the way, looks shiny black. So there are two ways you can get a sparse pattern of highlights. One is you can have a sparse pattern of lights, or you can have a shiny black surface. And the question is, can people tell them apart? And the answer to that is no. And I'll show you some evidence for that. So here's a demonstration of that. This is a way of representing the illumination field. So these are, the way these are made is you get a chrome ball and you take a photograph of it and then you map the, the you take a couple of photographs of it. 
actually you take numerous photographs of it, and you uh, warp those into a map that looks like this. And most renders in computer graphics will let you uh, use one of these maps to illuminate the scene. And so here I show four of them. There's a, an exhibit hall, a darkened exhibit hall. Uh, this is an esplanade, an atrium. It's my white room. And this is a weird one. It's a snowfield on a cloudy day, so you're pretty much getting the same amount of light from everywhere. So which of these is the sparsest pattern of illumination? What do you think? The bottom left? Well, it's actually this one. See, most of this is black. Oh, okay. um, this actually has, well, the second most uniform pattern of illumination, because the light literally is coming from everywhere. Um, and we can, I'll show you how we can tell that in a second. But uh, so these are the light maps we used. And then what we did is we illuminated a bunch of objects and then we had subjects. We also varied the intensity of illumination, like in the previous demo I showed you. And then we had the observers, just the completely naive observers, um, at, with my colleague at University of Western Kentucky. And they would come in and they would categorize. Do I think this object is white? Do I think the object is shiny black? Uh, do I think the object looks like metal? And here are some examples. So these are three different, these are all metal objects. How many of you think this one looks like shiny black? Raise your hand. What light field do you think this one was illuminated by? It's illuminated by the exhibit hall, the one here on the top. How many of you think this one looks like metal? Raise your hand. Which one do you think illuminated that one? That one was illuminated by uh, this light field right here. All right, I'm seeing a double take on one of your parts. Uh, these two objects are exactly the same. They're both the same shape. They're both the same material. The only difference is they're illuminated by different light maps. And then if we illuminate with uh, this one, this one gets really weird results. Our observers say they, they don't know what to make of this one. Some say it looks a little like metal. Some say it looks a little shiny white. Some say they don't know what the hell it is. Um, but again, all the differences that you see there are not due to the material. They're not doing it due to the shape of the objects. It's due entirely to how the objects were illuminated. All right, now let me explain how we can try and understand this. So the uh, the variable that we came up with that I think is going on here. So we did a simple thing. You can do this in Photoshop. Uh, we take the image. Uh, we isolate the region of the object. So we exclude the background. And then we threshold it. So we set all the pixels. Well, I don't even have to do that. We count the number of pixels that are above some threshold. So in this case, it's an intensity of 50, right? So how many pixels here you think are above an intensity of 50? Any wild guesses? What do you think? Few. Not many. Not many. Just kidding, a lot. Based on your response there. <laughs> <laughs> how many here are above 50? Not many again. Not many there and a lot here. So this one actually is about 20% of the pixels are above a threshold of 50. This one is something like 95%, and this one's like 80%. All right, so if you just simply count the number of pixels, so what are we doing? We're calculating the area over which the specular highlights are distributed. The idea being is that the shiny black surfaces are going to have highlights over fewer regions of the surface 
because there are a large number of regions where they reflect hardly any light at all. And that's not true for metal surfaces. And that correlates very highly with the data. So that measure I just described to you is called specular coverage. And if we look at the subject's confidence that they're looking at shiny black, right, so when the specular coverage is high, they're saying, no way it's shiny black. So they have zero confidence that it's shiny black. And as the specular coverage goes down, then now I'm really confident it's shiny black. This correlation, by the way, accounts for about 86% of the variance. So for something as crude as a confidence rating, that's a pretty high percentage of the variance that you would typically get in an experiment like this. Shiny white ones are a little, I'm sorry, the metal ones ratings are a little bit dicier. Um, for most of the light fields, you get a very high linear correlation, but you see these red ones here? They're from that snowfield light map. So this one is, that's this one here. All right, so what happens here is you get very high coverage, um, but you don't get really high metalness confidence. And you see that in the responses, right? So high specular coverage, but the metal responses are lower here. That's because it's switched over to shiny white instead. So there's, there's a wrinkle that this model doesn't completely account for, but as a first pass, it's a pretty good model. <coughs> All right, let's call, talk about some other materials. Um, the perception of glass. Um, glass is a photographer's nightmare. Um, they waste countless hours because if you just take a regular, say you take glass objects on the table and you just photograph them with a flash bulb, you'll get something that looks like this, which no photographer would want to show you that image. Um, and so they, they have special techniques for doing glass. One's called the bright field method, which I've demonstrated here, and one's called the dark field method, which I've demonstrated here. And it turns out that um, images of glass objects have some interesting properties. Do you see this object here? You see how the bumps on the object, you're getting contours that surround each bump, like here and here and here and there and there and there and there and all along there. Um, those are caused by the inner reflections of light on the inside of the object. I won't go through the physics of this, but basically it's really easy for light to get inside a glass object, but it's much harder for it to get out. And that's because of the way the Fresnel equations work. Uh, so light gets trapped in the glass and it, it starts bouncing around. You get lots and lots of indirect reflections. And they're what causes these bands of bright regions. You see it over here uh, in this region, right? You get this band right here. This is a bump on the object, but it's concave if you look, think of the object from the inside. And so you get these like swirly things. They almost look like patterns of flow in water. Um, so we published a paper on this last year and I had a hypothesis that these swirly patterns are um, an important source of information uh, about glass. And so we came up with a way of testing it where we um, basically took a glass object like this and then we went into Photoshop and did an edge finder. So basically what it does is it looks for all the regions where the in image intensity is changing very rapidly and draws a contour there. So here all the shading information has been taken away and all you're left with is a pattern of contours. And do you all agree that this looks a lot like glass? Well, that's how our subjects judge it. So they judge this to be as glassy as that did. 
But now we got a problem because is that the case that subjects would draw any contour pattern to be glass? We needed a control of some sort. And so we generated another set of stimuli like this. And subjects never write this as glass. So what these data show is not only are the contours providing enough by themselves, providing enough information for us to identify glass as glass, but it has to be contours that could in fact arise from a glass surface. And so if you use contours like this, that's not the case. And subjects will rate this as, well, I don't know what it is, but it's not glass. So very high confidence here that it's not glass. Very high confidence here that it is glass. Again, so this is the first experiment that I know of that's really honing in on all right, how do we identify glass materials. And I'll do one last thing on materials and then I'll move on, um, which would be translucent materials. I showed you this before. So how would, how would you label this material? Okay, or wax or gelatin or something like that. Um, and again, notice one of the key things here, so you can see through the surface here, but if we cut this off, it would still look that way because it's, see how this corner lights up a bit? That's because the light near the corner can get in the material and then get back out because it doesn't have to pass through a lot of depth. And I'll show you how this works in a second. So this is an experiment we did on this. So what you see on the left here is an opaque object. The right is a translucent object. Can anybody tell the difference between them? I probably shouldn't have put the labels up there and I would, should have you judge which is which. You would have been at random though. But yeah. The Oh, good observation, right near the edge. And why do you think that's happening? Because the light, when it just hits the edge, it doesn't have to go very far inside the material. It's able to get out. But that's a good observation. But now let's put some bumps on the material. Now, do you agree these are labeled correctly? Does this one look translucent and that not? It's the same light field, it's the same material. The only thing that's different is I've changed the surface geometry. And so you have these little ridges here that the light can pass through, which they can't do for these ridges. And that changes how you perceive the material. So the point I'm trying to make here is that material perception is sort of funny. It's not based exclusively on the material itself. It can be affected by how the material is lighted, and it can be affected by um, how the, by the shape of the object. Photographers, by the way, are well aware of all this stuff, and they exploit it, right? So they work, they spend a lot of time, if you go to a professional photographer, adjusting the lighting. So let's say you have a, a nose that you want to um, take attention away from. A photographer can adjust the, the lighting so your nose looks bigger or smaller. And they will do that. They, can, they do amazing things with lighting, um, which interacts with the shape. All right then, well that's all I have for surface, oh, one last thing. Um, the material can also affect the shape. So let's take this object right here. Let's pick on you this time. Tell me, describe those rings, if you will. Um, like in terms of material or, or the specular color? Uh, in terms of the shape of them. Oh. Um, so they have a yeah, they fairly have a sharp edge sharp here? Sharp point, yeah, yeah, sharp edge. How about this one? Do they have a sharp point? All right, so the shapes look quite different. Uh, they're actually exactly the same shape. The difference is, is the light that passes through these uh, makes this look more gradual than you get this sharp highlight and sharp shadow on the opposite side that affects this. So not only can the shape affect the 
appearance of the material, the material can also affect the perception of shape. And that now gets us to the last topic that I want to do in this section, which is shape from shading. Yes? Can I ask you a question about the elephant glass? Um, sure. Because you said that contours are what's going to provide us with the information that um, we need to know that it's glass. But then it's only going to be certain contours. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the point of this is that somehow we know, we see a pattern of contours from the structure. I don't know how we do this, but we say, oh yeah, that, those contours could occur from a, if that object were glass. But other contours, we say, no, 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 that's, that's not what you would get with reflections and refractions on glass materials. That demo is brand new. We're running that experiment as we speak. I'm really excited by it. Um, primarily because of the way that we can distinguish different contours from each other, uh, which is a topic I'll come back to later in the course, which is quite important in uh, lots of aspects of perception. But now I want to focus the rest of the time we have on how does shading tell you about shape. And um, this is a classic example of that. And there are a number of computational models. How many in Alicia's students do we have in here? No Alicia students? Oh, who's a, a student of Alicia Martinez? Just you? I thought there were others in the class. I thought there were others in the class. Uh, one was already taking four classes, so you had to drop it on four. Ah, uh, okay. Um, all right, well, let's pick on you. I'll get you involved. So uh, when you took his class in um, machine vision, did you learn about shape from shading? Yeah. Uh, and what assumptions do they typically make? Oh, geez. Uh, right, so they're here. You assume surfaces have matte reflectance. There are no specular highlights, no effects of transparency and translucently. And you're basically assuming everything you possibly can to make these horrible equations solvable. And even then, I'll show you that you can't get a unique solution. There's still uh, an ambiguity, which I'll describe in a second. Um, you assume that all surfaces and regions are illuminated homogeneously from a single direction and there are no shadows or indirect reflections. And even with those assumptions, a pattern of shading does not allow a unique 3D interpretation. Now, how many of you have been to Europe before? And you went to a bunch of old churches, and they had panels on them that looked like that. You know what that's called? Bob's relief. Bob relief. And um, why do you think they do with this. So what makes bas relief different from other kinds of sculpture? These things are really flat. So a coin, you know, the like George Washington on a coin. Right, you see George Washington clearly, but there's hardly any depth there at all. And that's what they do on these buildings. And the reason why they do it is because if you had these figures sticking out a couple of feet, Right? Gravity would operate on them. They wouldn't be very stable. They'd, they'd decay and fall down. And say so they do it this way. But the interesting thing is that these look pretty normal. You don't notice that they're flattened as much as they are. So here's the bas relief ambiguity. This is a theorem that was proven by a bunch of computer vision guys at Yale. And the idea is, for any given pattern of shading, there is an infinite number of possible surface interpretations that are all related by an affine transformation. There's a dreaded term has come back again. We're going to see that again over the next few lectures. Um, and so the idea is that here, if you're looking from the statue from the front, you wouldn't notice that this is what it looks like from the side. 
And so the question is, what they're arguing is that when you look at it from the front, there's a whole family of possible interpretations for this, and you pick the one that is the most normal looking. So here's an example of this. Um, here we have a normal face illuminated like so. Here we have a squashed face where the light and the face have been squashed together. Here we have a stretched out face. Here we have a sheared face. And this is what they look like. They all look the same. How can that be? So when I first saw this, I said, no, that, no way, that can't be true. So I figured I'd do my own example. And here's what I came up with. So these two faces, this face is the same as that, and this face is the same as that. Anybody see the difference between those? That's the bas-relief ambiguity. This isn't that, it's this. Now, I have a funny story to tell about this because I didn't know about this paper when it first came out. Uh, but at about the same time, I was over in the Netherlands and we were doing an experiment with my colleagues that you've heard um, much about in this course, Jan Kunderink and the people in his group. And what we were doing is we were trying to uh, we had several different ways of measuring the shape of a surface. And what we were trying to do is cross-validate those measures, right? So if the measures are good measures, if I have one way of measuring shape and a second measure, they should both tell me the same result. That says you're probably on to something right if you get that result. That's what we were trying to do. And so as stimuli, we use these things right here. Is anybody an art buff that has any idea where these images came from? This is a uh, Hungarian uh, sculptor, a guy by the name of Brancusi, who many people argue is the father of modern sculpture. And um, I was at a museum a number of years ago in the Netherlands, and they had um, Van Gogh's hanging on the wall without any special security. They had uh, Mondrian's hanging on the wall without any special security. And they had one of Brancusi's eggs. And that thing was in this big plexiglass cabinet with like 20 different locks on it, uh, which led me to believe that this was probably a rather valuable piece of art. But in any event, these are all um, pictures of Brancusi sculptures. Let's see if you can guess what is this. Anybody want to venture a guess? This is a bird. You should have raised your hand. You would have got kudos. <laughs> this one I won't ask you. It's an egg. How about this one? What's that? Face. A face. Good for you. All right. If anybody can guess this one, you really get a gold star. Very good. You all get gold stars. All right. So these are why he's the father of modern sculpture. So he. So these were our stimuli. Now the problem with this, using this as stimuli, is you have absolutely no way of getting the ground truth because nobody was going to let us get anywhere near these sculptures to measure what the actual shapes are. So all we have is perceptual data. And we use four techniques. One of them I think I've talked about before is you have this probe that you adjust so this thing looks like it's just sitting on the surface. So this one looks like it's set right, this one obviously not. We had a second task where you have to judge which dot appears closer, the red one or the green one. What do you think? Holler it out. All right, so red dots wins. That's a task. That, that task is really easy. Um, and then we had a third task, 
where um, you'd see an image, you have a row of dots like so, and then you'd have to adjust another set of dots over here so that the shape of this looks like the way the depth is changing on this curve. This is what we call the profile task. And among the researchers, we had a big fight as the best way to do this. So uh, Jan and I argued that the only natural way to do this is have the, the line that you're adjusting be the same as the line that you're trying to match. Uh, but our colleagues, uh, Anz and Dorn and Ostrich Copper said, no, 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 that, that's not a valid technique. You have to have the adjustment task always be the same. And so they insisted that it, the experiment be done this way. And we fought about this for several hours and neither side would give an inch. And so then we did probably the most ridiculous decision in the history of experimental design. We decided we'd let the women do it one way and the men do it a different way. Uh, which turned out to be a fortunate, stupid error, but uh, I'll explain that in a second. So we can break down uh, the number of points that we're sampling on these things. So this pretty dense sampling over each surface using each technique. And um, from each of the techniques, we can also then generate a depth map. These, think of these like ISO contours on a map. So each contour here represents equal apparent depth on the surface. And these are the different conditions. Let me go jump to the data. So let me explain this plot. So here we have the different observers. This is uh, Ans van Dorn, Ostrid Coppers, Jan Kunderink, and James Todd. Uh, these are the four different objects. Number three, by the way, is the turtle. And these are the correlations between different methods. Now, what I want to focus you on is, let's come down here. This is the best example of this. This is me, and I'm a professional psychophysical observer. Nobody's more reliable than I am at doing tasks like this. Um, and remember, the purpose of our study is to do uh, cross-validation of the different methods. And what do you see in these comparisons right here? What's the correlation? So this is correlation of one would be up here. It's a correlation of zero. So this is a professional observer looking at the same stimuli with different measures of trying to get at the underlying perceived shape for the different methods. And the correlation between the methods is Zero. That's, yes? What do, what do the different, uh, like on the x-axis, what does that represent? So the x-axis is different. This is not a good graph because I should have that on there. Okay. So the x-axis is all possible pairwise combinations of the method, right? So let's say three is the turtle, and this would be a comparison of the profile task horizontal with the um, circle adjustment task. And this would be the circle adjustment task with the um, profile task diagonal. All right, so each, each bar here is a different combination. I'll give you a hint. All the ones that are zero are correlations that involve this task, right? So if you compare this task with any of the others, you get a correlation of zero. All the others, if you correlate between them, the um, correlation is pretty high. So now we come back to the mistake that we made. Remember, it was the women were the only ones who ran this task, and the men were the only ones that ran the other one. So we figured maybe we found this amazing gender difference in perceived shape and we'll make the cover of Science Magazine. Uh, or maybe it's something more mundane like these tasks behave very differently. So in this one you have to sort of mentally rotate the objects to do it. So with much complaining, uh, we had the men do this one and the women do the other one. And um, 
we all had the same result. So this task just behaves really weirdly. As I said, that's all the ones near zero, so Jan does the same thing. Ans does the same thing. I'm sorry, Jan does a little bit better. Ans and Ostrid, uh, same thing. So what do you do on this? You've run an experiment, you're trying to test cross-validation with the different techniques you're using. And you find out that at least in some of the conditions we're getting a correlation of zero. You can't just send this off for publication. So what happens? You shove it in a drawer. Just like the texture experiment I showed you earlier. So the year after we did this, so this was done in the Netherlands, and Jan and Ostrich came and visited me in um, Ohio when we did the texture experiment that was fit in a drawer because I couldn't figure out that data either. Um, and Jan apparently had discovered the paper, paper by uh, Bellamer, Kriegman, and Yule on the bas-relief ambiguity. And the idea that uh, you've got this affine, uh, this family of affine transformations that are all equivalent. Right, so the observer has to bring something to the table. The shading isn't telling you an exact shape. It's giving you a family of shapes and you have to pick one. So maybe the different tasks are forcing you to pick different members from that family of shapes. That was the idea. And so what we ended up doing was, uh, in the first analysis, we did a linear correlation. So what that gives you is the, the shape up to a depth scaling. But you can also do uh, something that looks like this. It's called an affine correlation that gives you both a depth scaling, that's the C parameter, and a shear. Shear transformation looks like that. And lo and behold, when you do that, all of a sudden, all those correlations jump up near one. So now that accident, because of the fight that we did, with, uh, with the four researchers led us to a really cool discovery where we can really verify the bas-relief ambiguity in human data. So basically what this is showing is that observers get the affine structure perfectly, right? The only thing they're missing is the, the part that's ambiguous within that one parameter family. The parts that are not ambiguous, they're nailing perfectly. Um, and that's what the affine correlation shows us. So the, uh, the black bars are showing you the linear correlation, the red bars are showing you the affine correlation, and the, the extra variance you account for with the red over the black is telling you how much the observer's judgments were sheared. Right? So the observer's judgments have been sheared, and uh, the way to measure that is with the affine correlation. And this is a good example of that. Any questions about this before I move on? All right, because this is something we're going to see over and over again uh, as we go along. So the idea, you have got a, a given source of information, in this case, shading. Shading is not giving you a unique interpretation of the shape. It's giving you a family of possible interpretations. So if you're an observer and I tell you, tell me what the shape is, and all the shading is telling you a family of possible alternatives, you've got to pick something from that family, right? It's not being specified by the stimulus. It's you, however you do it, maybe you use the one that's most likely, maybe you use the one that you're most familiar with, uh, maybe you flip a coin, I don't know, whatever it is you do, but you have to do something to come up with that extra shape. And what these data are showing us is that the subjects get all the parts, right? Anything that's not ambiguous within that family, they get perfectly. And it's only the ambiguous parts that change using one task relative to the other. I'll show you another quick example of this. I'm gonna go through this quickly since we're running out of time. Uh, this is the dissertation of my student, uh, Eric Egan. And in this case, what he's doing is looking at what happens to shape when you move the illumination around? So when you move the illumination, you're changing the pattern of shading. 
would that influence the perception of your shape? Or does the appearance of shape change as the illumination changes? And here are two of the examples he used. Um, uh, these guys are illuminated from the left. These are illuminated from the right. And then we have them um, done from the diagonal. We can either show the whole object with its occlusion contours or mask it off. I'm not going to talk about this manipulation. So those are the different conditions. And so what these data show are the same analysis we did in the previous experiment. So we're going to subject the data to a linear correlation and an affine correlation. And what the, what the difference between those is telling you how much the object has been sheared. Uh, and as you see, there's a significant amount of shear here. That's the red. That's the difference between the affine correlation and the linear correlation. These are the different directions of illuminations. But the cool thing here is the following. If you look at the direction of the shear, what you find is, so let's say, for example, that you're looking at my head, like so. And let's say I'm illuminated from off to the right. What will happen is my head will be sheared like so. If I'm illuminated from off to the left, my head will be sheared like so. So it's like the shape of the object is being distorted relative to the direction of illumination. Very regular effect. So you can see the direction of shear changing systematically with the direction of illumination. Again, another really good example of the bas-relief ambiguity and how it can systematically affect observers' judgments. So let me, let me just uh, summarize this part before I move on to the last part of the lecture. Uh, because the logic of this, we're going to see again next week and the week after that. Um, so the basic idea is the following, that a given source of information, more often than not, does not give you a unique interpretation of an object's structure. It gives you a family of possibilities. And you have to pick, if you're judging a shape, something from that family. <coughs> and there are other factors that can cause you to pick differently in different contexts. So one of them is the direction of illumination. <clears throat> so the direction of illumination causes the appearance of the object to look like it's being sheared toward the light source. It's a perfectly reasonable kind of distortion because the image is ambiguous to those alternative interpretations. Uh, and how we pick the possible alternative is determined in this case by the extraneous factor where's the light coming from. And so we're starting to see a trend here, is that if we look at the perception of materials, the perception of shape, um, they're not independent with one another. They interact. Shape is dependent on materials. Shape is dependent on lighting. Materials are dependent on lighting. Materials are dependent on shape. Um, and that's a, that's a general theme that we'll run into without. A lot of times our um, perceptions are an approximation. And um, there are other factors that can affect that <coughs> approximation. Let me switch gears. I want to tell you about one more experiment. Oh, oh, I forgot about this one. All right. Here's an example of getting material constancy on shape. So I've talked to you about uh, how lighting can change the appearance. But what about changes in the material? How does it affect shape? And this is an experiment done by Fleming, Taralbo, and Adelson. And the question they were asking is, well, how about really shiny surfaces like this? Can you see the shapes of them? <clears throat> Notice that this violates all the assumptions of shape from shading algorithms. And it turns out, I'll go this through quickly, if you look at the scatter plots here, observers are really good at this. And um, the information they propose, this is really interesting because uh, this was done 
completely independently of our directional width gradient, but that's what they proposed as the information, is you exploit the reflections on the object as a texture. And um, the description they give is almost identical to, without the equation, uh, to what they describe was exactly what directional width gradients are. So here it's being applied not in the case of surface markings, but in the case of um, reflections of an environment on shiny surfaces. All right, now we're ready for this one. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we've talked about perception of materials. We've talked about the perception of object geometry. But the third thing that affects all this is going on is illumination. So I've shown you how illumination can affect material perception, how illumination can affect shape perception. But now the question is, what do we know about the illumination? Do we know anything at all? So what do you know about the illumination in this room? Um, it's brighter in that area than it is up here. Okay. So the way we're going to test this that's the question we're going to try to ask. But obviously we're not going to ask subjects verbally because, well, how would I describe such a thing, right? They would go through exactly the thought process. Why is he picking on me? Um, that's what you get for sitting in the front. Um, so how can we address that question? Uh, these are the stimuli we used, and we used three types of illumination. So we have a, a bunch of uh, penguins uh, there's a funny story that goes behind this. The, uh, through a lot of our earlier experiments, I, th I think I showed you one of this. Uh, Jan's favorite stimuli is a, a medical mannequin nude torso. And uh, he's probably used those in 20 experiments. And Ostrid Coppers just announced, just before we did this experiment, she said if he used those torsos again, she wasn't going to participate in the experiment. I'm quitting. No more torsos. And uh, Jan said, okay, 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 I'll use something else. And so he bought a bunch of statues of penguins and we used those uh, in here, uh, which Astrid was satisfied was much less offensive than torso. She probably wouldn't have minded the torsos if he also used male ones, but um, in any event. Uh, so we have this scene of penguins standing around there and they're illuminated in a sunny day light, right? So sunny day, you've got a, a single light source from a single direction, hard cast shadows like you see here. Uh, you've got a cloudy day where it's much more diffuse light. And then you've got this scene here where the light is actually in the scene and you can see it. And the task on each trial, what the observers had to do is we would put a probe ball, like right here, and observers could, could adjust the shading on this ball. Uh, and they were supposed to adjust it so it looks like it fits within the scene. Right, so in other words, if a ball were here, well there is a ball there, how should it be shaded for the pattern of illumination where uh, that's going on there? And so here are different placements of the ball. And it turns out observers are remarkably good at this. Uh, one of the things they get is they adjust for the intensity of the light with distance. So here you see how this one looks brighter, which closest to the light is this one's dimmer as it gets farther away and this one dimmer as it's farther on. So observers are taking into account the attenuation of the light with distance. However, what they don't take into account are shadows. So typically what observers will do is you put the probe there, they'll adjust it like so. This is what it ought to look like though because this position is being in the shadow of this object. Observers never get that right. And if you look at a lot of artists, they, they screw up shadows. Even good artists can screw up shadows. Um, they mess it up. I should say three of the four observers here were physicists. So they, I mean, they know about shadows. 
it just didn't pop into their minds perceptually when they were doing this particular task. Um, now, after we did this experiment, uh, Jan Kunderink and the other woman in this experiment, um, Sylvia Pont, this woman right here, she was an assistant to Jan back then. She's now a big full professor at University of Delft and one of the leading researchers in the world on material perception. And she's also been pushing hard on the idea of the light field. And she recently did a, a really wonderful experiment, I think, um, where she used a, a living room. And unlike our original study, uh, they not only had subjects make uh, adjustments for probes within the scene, but they also had a special camera where they could measure the light flow at different points in the scene. So they had measurements of the real light field and they had observers' judgments about what they thought the light field should look like. So here's an example of the measured light field. These are, you think of these as light tubes. Intensity is inversely proportional to the width of those tubes. So the wider they are, um, the intensity drops off. Um, now, why are these light tubes look curved, do you think? Notice there's one lamp in this scene, and the light should emanate from the lamp. So why shouldn't you just see a bunch of straight lines emanating from this point? If you can answer this question, you'll get a gold star for the last three lectures. Yeah? Is it refracting in the air? Refracting in the air? Or bouncing off air particles? Um, what do you mean by refraction in this case? Like it's passing through some part of the air molecule and then it bends because of it? Oh, okay. I mean, that's not a crazy answer. It turns out that air is completely, you say you don't get any refraction through air. But that's not a bad answer, yeah. Um, well, you're getting at themes of the course. The answer to this is not a, uh, not a major theme. But we talked about it a couple of lectures ago. What kinds of reflection did we talk about? Did you hear about indirect reflection? Do you remember what that is? So what happens when the light from the lamp hits the wall? It bounces off the wall in a different direction. And so it's the indirect light from the wall that's causing these things to curve. Now, if you look at observers' judgments for what they think the light field is, right? So you put these probes in and you ask them, adjust the shading so it looks like it fits within this light probe. If the observers were really good at judging the light field, then they would reflect those, reflect the inner reflections. I didn't mean to say it that way, but uh, those inner reflections would be taken into account, but they're not. So if you look at the observer's judgments, all these flow directions are perfectly straight. So the moral of the story is that there are a couple of things observers get wrong about the light field. Number one, they're pretty clueless about shadows. And what these data show is they're also clueless about surface inner reflections, all right? So the moral of the story is we do have some information about how light's flowing through here, um, but it's limited. It's only the direct light flow that we have a reasonable knowledge of, and the more complicated stuff, uh, not, not so much. On that note, I will let you go. I'll see you on Thursday, and we will be talking about uh, structure for motion.